Will you join me in prayer? Mighty God, Holy Father, Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the blessing we receive through your name. God, we thank you for the problem we just had. We thank you for the opportunity to run out of fruit of the vine, Father, because so many are here. We thank you for that blessing. We thank you for the excitement that is in this room. We thank you for the praise that we have shared. We thank you for the love that we cherish. We thank you for the faith that saves. Bless us always. Make us as a congregation more like you each and every day. In Christ we pray. Amen. I want to draw your attention to Hebrews chapter 5. Uh, we're preaching through Hebrews. We are taking a sermon from each chapter of, of Hebrews. And I feel like Hebrews chapter 5 is one of the more theologically exciting chapters of Scripture. But like I told you, we're not so much teaching the book of Hebrews, you know, giving a detailed lesson on that, if you would like a detailed lesson on each chapter, a blow-by-blow, verse-by-verse study of the book of Hebrews and everything it teaches and says. Um, come find me and we'll try to set that up. Because this is a very rich book. It's a very complicated book. It's a difficult book in ways, too. However, what we're doing this morning, and we've been doing for the last several weeks, and we'll continue to do so in the coming weeks, is we're preaching through it. Meaning, we're taking each chapter individually and we're drawing a sermon, an individual sermon, from each chapter. And this is where it gets kind of hard for me. Because you see, in Hebrews chapter 5, the first 10 verses you get one of the most succinct and enlightening and, in, I think, inspiring doctrinal lessons concerning the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, concerning atonement. And he takes the, the Hebrew author takes the first 10 verses to discuss how Jesus is our high priest. And as all high priests before him, Jesus offers not only one, but two sacrifices. And I can't just skip over it because it's just it's too good. You see, when we think of the sacrifices that Jesus makes, he, he makes more than one. We like to think about his primary sacrifice, his death on the cross for our sins, and certainly that is the primary sacrifice. That's the one that gets the most screen time, as it should. <laughs> but he makes more than just that one sacrifice. You see, the high priest in the old, in old covenant Israel, what they would do is they were going to offer this Yom Kippur sacrifice, this day of atonement sacrifice, which would atone for the sins of the nation as a whole. And what they would do is they would recognize, before I can offer the sacrifice for the people's sin, I have to offer a sacrifice for my own sin. So they would add, three animals would die. Not two, three. What would happen is, yes, you had the Azazel goat that was considered the bearer of the people's sin that would be sent out into the wilderness. Then you had the goat that was slain and his blood was drawn and his, it was sprinkled on the, of the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant. But there was a third animal that was slain before those two, and it was a bull for the, the high priest himself to offer as an atonement sacrifice, covering any sin that might be in the, in the way of him offering this greater corporate sacrifice for the people. But see, here's the thing. Jesus doesn't have any sin to atone for. He doesn't have any sin to atone for, so there's no bulls being offered by Jesus for atonement. So what does he do? He offers, instead of a sacrifice, a single sacrifice of atonement, he offers a lifelong sacrifice of consecration, and it's his sinful life, or sinless life, I should say, that he lives for you and me. Did you know that Jesus' life itself was a sacrifice? Because if you think about it, who was he before the incarnation? He was God in full, and he put on flesh. Guess what you call that, church? It's a sacrifice. And guess what? He's still that God-man right now. He's still bearing that resurrected flesh body right now for me. It's not a step down because God can't take a step down and be God, but it is a change of state. God underwent a change for me. He bore that sacrifice for me. He starts with that sacrifice, consecrating himself to the work of the Lord as a man who also happens to be God. And then, at the end of that life, he offers a second sacrifice by dying on the cross for my sins so that I could be consecrated to God. It's a beautiful, 
albeit somewhat detailed, picture. But as I was reading through Hebrews chapter 5, as great as I think that is, and as exciting, as, as doctrinally and theologically exciting as I find that passage, I read through Hebrews chapter 5 and I realized that's not the section I need to preach about. You see, there are things that as a preacher you want to preach about, and then there are things that as a preacher you know you have to preach about. And while the Bible nerd in me really wants to talk about verses 1 through 10, the minister in me knows we have to talk about the last few verses, starting in verse 11. Because he kind of switches gears. Because what happens is, the Hebrew author realizes in the first 10 verses, he recognizes that what he is saying to them might be a little difficult for them to understand. And instead of it causing him to look at them with pity or, you know, looking down on them and saying, it's okay, I'll walk you through this. And, and patience, he doesn't do that. Instead, it creates frustration in him. And he says this, starting in verse 11. He says, about this, we have much to say. And I would say so. I read those first 10 verses and I'm like, wait, two sacrifices, not one. Tell me more. Let's get into the detail. What about this? What about that? What about this branching statement from that branching statement? I want to roadmap this, these verse 10 verses as a theologian. He says, about this we have much to say, and it is what? It is hard to explain. This, what he's saying is this. This is in day one stuff, y'all. This is, to, this is top tier Christian thought. It is hard to explain, but here's why. Since you have become what? Dull of hearing. That's rude. Right? He finishes verse 10 and he goes, wait, tell me more. He says, I can't tell you more because you're deaf. You're not listening. Church, is there a difference between hearing and listening? If you're a mom in this room, you know exactly what I'm talking about right? There is, a co there is a quantitative difference between hearing somebody and listening to somebody. Hearing is simply being aware of the information. Listening is processing said information, right? Here's what he is saying. Remember, to these Jewish Christians who are thinking of abandoning their faith and going back to Judaism to avoid persecution, he is saying this to them. I would love to explain this to you, but you're not going to get it because you might hear me, but you never listen. You might hear me and never listen. I'll be honest with you. This is the chapter where the Hebrew author goes into full-blown dad mode. Right? I remember once um, I was... I was sitting with uh, a couple, a relatively young married couple, who had just had their first child. And we were sitting in a church service with them. And the, uh, I say just, this, this, this little kid's about, about two, pushing three, right? It's relatively new parents. And he's making a lot of noise. <laughs> he's making a lot of noise. He's singing. He's singing church songs, God bless him but he's singing. He's saying, Jesus loves me. And that's not the song we're singing, right? This I know. He's called, ah, 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 ah. he's coloring. And the parents are like, oh, sweetheart, sweet, sweet, sweetie. And these are family members of mine, by the way, so this, don't, don't get too freaked out by this. So, but they go, sweetheart, go, get, you're just it's like, you're just, shh, it's okay, it's okay. But say, here, look at this, look at this. And he goes, yeah, look at this. Like, no, no, no. And like, they're, they're really struggling and people are looking. And finally, I get annoyed enough. <laughs> Who I look at, and I'll, this isn't his name, but I'll say, Braxton. I go, look at me, I go, Braxton. And he goes, and I go, you sit down, and be quiet. And he goes, <laughs> and the dad, I'm not kidding, the dad looks at me and goes, how did you do that? <laughs> and I looked at him and said, I use the dad voice. We were in a, we were in a, we were in a, um, I think it was, a, uh, it was either a Target or a Walmart, I can't remember, and m our kids were misbehaving, and I, and, and, and I know, right? 
William's kids misbeha misbehaving? <laughs> um, um, but here's the, here's the thing. Our kids were misbehaving somewhat, Addie was, and she was doing something that she knew she wasn't supposed to be doing, but she was a good chunk ahead of me. She was a good, you know, 10 feet ahead of me, and, and I decide this is an appropriate time to use the dad voice, and I go, and I go, hey, knock it off, like that, and three separate kids that I'm not related to <laughs> jump at attention. They go, I'm surprised they didn't go, that dad voice is magical. It's great. I love it. I love it. This is the Hebrew writer using his dad voice. I'd love to explain it to you, moron. That's what he's saying. But you're too stupid to hear me. And, they're, and they're, they said they're going, yeah, sorry. And here's why. Why is he talking in that way? These are adults he's talking to. These aren't children. Why talk to them in such a demeaning way? He tells them, verse 12, for though by this time you ought to be what? He's saying you're not new Christians. You're not babes in Christ. Many of you have been Christians for years. Many of you have been Christians for years, able to discern these things. You should be, I should be able to talk to you about the, the dual sacrifice of Jesus Christ, and you understand and keep up with me the whole time through, because you should be mature enough to understand it. But here's what he says. You ought to be teachers. Not only should you understand it, you should be able to explain it. You need someone to teach you, again, the What? the basic principles and oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. How many of you have heard this example used in the New Testament before? Paul uses it. This is another reason why some people think that Hebrews might be written by Paul, because it uses even a Pauline metaphor. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, since he is a what? Ooh, that's demeaning. That's demeaning. You, uh, husbands, you want to get your wife good and hop and mad at you to take, to take an argument to the next level? Here's how you do it. After she's finished complaining to you about whatever she is, is complaining, she's complaining about, Mark, look at her and say, you're such a child. <laughs> now you've got a fight on your hands. Don't do it in the kitchen because there are knives in there. Do it in a nice, soft space. That will instantly elevate any, any argument to a fight, right? You've got something big on your hands. Calling somebody a child, why is it demeaning? Because you don't want to be a child. Look, I hear people say occasionally that high school was the best years of their life. Do you remember high school? <coughs> high school was lame. I had to ask before I went anywhere anywhere. You know what it makes me think when somebody says that high school are the best years of life? It's like, oh, broken home. Because my dad made high school miserable. He really did. Where are you going? Who are you going with? What are you going to do when you get here? When you get there, what time are you going to be home? Don't do this, 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 and this, and this. And call me. And if you don't call me, I'll murder you. My mom, call me when you get there. I'm going down the street to Jeff's house. I know, still call me. This is before cell phones, by the way. You guys hear, you know, some of you hear that and go, well, that's easy. I got a phone in my pocket. Imagine trying to track down a payphone to call your mom and tell her you're not dead. Because if you don't tell her you're not dead, she'll kill you. <laughs> High school wasn't fun. Why? Because of the rules because of the rules, because of the restrictions. Why did I have those rules and restrictions? Because my parents knew something about teenagers that teenagers seem to not know about themselves, your children. I'm not a child. I'm almost an adult. Almost means you're a child. I hate to tell you that. The hardest part about being a teenager is the same, is the same thing as the hardest part about being tone deaf. You know what the worst part about being tone deaf is? You're tone deaf, so you don't know you're tone deaf. 
Most tone deaf people think they can really sing. They can't. They can't hear how bad they are. They can't. The worst part about being a teenager is not knowing anything, but thinking you know everything. Believing you know everything. And you know why you believe that? Because you don't know. And you think that I'm old enough to handle certain things. But you, recognize, you haven't recognized that you have maturing to do. I tell you what, as a youth minister, I was never more proud of our youth group. I was never more proud of the teens I was working with when I saw them make decisions based upon their own immaturity rather than their own assumed maturity. I can't do that. Why not? I'm not old enough. I want to hug that kid and say, I'm so proud of you. Thank you for recognizing your own limitations. Don't you wish adults would do the same? Because as soon as you recognize your own limitations, you can, make the pro- you can begin the process of correcting them. Of correcting them. Ask any recovering addict, and they will tell you the first step in any recovery is recognition of the fact that you have an addiction. Amen? Church, that's how growing up works. We need to be more mature. He says, you're not mature enough to handle this, even though you should be. And I tell you what, that's disgusting. That's disgusting. When you see a grown man behaving like a 13-year-old boy, do you go, oh, that's cute? Or do you go, get a job? What's wrong with you? When we see a man driving a car he can't afford because he's going to, through a midlife crisis, do you go, oh, it must be fun to be in that guy's head? Or dating a woman who is way too young for him? Is that an endearing trait? Or do you look at people who do this and say, grow up. Act your what? Age. Ooh. Because we recognize something, church. Age is not just a number. It's a set of standards. You need milk, not solid food. Verse 13, for everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in what? The word of righteousness. The word of righteousness. Look, I don't get embarrassed for... For Christ, on behalf of Christianity when new Christians behave like new Christians because they're new Christians. When a new Christian comes up to me and asks me an obviously answered question about the Bible or their faith, I don't get frustrated. I don't get upset. I respond in patience. Why? Because they're a new Christian. But I tell you what does, frustrating, does frustrate me, and I'll tell you what does make me feel embarrassed on behalf of Christianity when Christians who have been Christians since they were 13 and now they're 50 do that. When Christians who have been Christians for decades behave still like they're new Christians. There have been times where I've been asked questions about moral compromises by men and women who have been with Christ long enough to know better, and I think to myself, not only should you not do this, but you should be so confident in not doing this that other people should be able to, younger Christians should be able to come to you for advice on this topic, and you give it to them. How many times have you heard a Christian who has been a Christian long enough to do so say, well, I can't teach children children's Bible hour course because I'm just not good enough at teaching or I don't know how to work with kids or I don't know enough about the Bible. Why not? What have you been doing this whole time? Honestly, what have you been doing this whole time? Just sitting in the pew? That's it? Church, we forget. We forget. Salvation is not an event. It's a process. I am being prepared for something, meaning I should be getting better and more like him every day. Why do you think I pray for that every time, church? Here's what else he says. 
Verse 14, but solid food is for the what? The mature. For those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. Do you know what the defining trait of maturity is? The one thing that determines whether you're mature or not, or immature. You know what it is? It's the word that's used here, discernment. Discernment. Now here he focuses on knowing the difference between, as Ray pointed out for his, uh, in his prayer earlier, between right and wrong, between good and evil. But you know what? Discernment's a lot broader than that. If I am a mature person, I should be able to discern between a good choice and a bad choice. If I am a mature Christian, I should be able to discern between a righteous choice and a sinful choice. Church, if you ever see someone who's been a Christian for a really long time who lacks this ability, it's not because they're not a Christian, and it's not because they're not saved. It's because they haven't grown up yet. It's because they've stalled out in their development. They have taken on a spiritual, theological, doctrinal disability. Is that harsh or is it true? Look, I'm not here to get anybody's goat, but what I am here to do is this, to make you seriously ask yourself, if I come to you as your minister and I ask you, to fill in as a, in a leadership position, like say a teaching position, whether, they be, whether it be for children or adults. If I come to you as a man and ask, you know, I'm not feeling really great this week, would you mind filling in on the Wednesday, Wednesday night men's Bible study? Or if I come to you as an established woman of the church and say, look, I've got this Bible study with this young lady, and I don't like to do these, these alone um, for sake of accountability, but also um, she's got some real questions about what it means to be a Christian and a woman that I, I'm not qualified to answer because I'm one of those things. Could you come to the, the study with me and, and answer her questions? If you say no to me, I'm not going to judge you too harshly. I'm not going to look at you and go, ugh. That's not going to happen. I'm going to love you in, in, your, in spite of your choice. I'm going to treat you with respect. But here's what I want you to do. I want you to take a long, hard look at yourself in the mirror. And I want you to ask yourself this question. I said no because I shouldn't be in that situation why? Why? I've been a Christian for a pretty long time. What? Why do I feel underqualified to be in that situation? And if I am, how do I fix it? Church, we got a lot of people here this morning. Isn't that great? But you know what that means? The more people we bring into this building, and I know God will bless us with it, the more people that we bring into this building, the more of us are going to need support and guidance. And I'm not enough people to do it all myself. We're going to have men and women here in this congregation who have serious questions, who have serious problems, who need serious guidance from serious Christians. Church, that's how we become serious Christians. We stop resting and we start growing. Not just numerically, but personally. I tell you this because, and this is why I knew I had to preach this passage, we're going to be giving you, as a congregation, coming up here in the weeks to come, opportunities for both men and women, individuals to their specific roles, to receive training on how to be involved in the education of others in this church. But you know what? Those classes will be meaningless if no one attends them. So I want you to really ask yourself, if I don't feel ready, why not? And what do I need in order 
to feel ready. Maybe you have some growing up to do, and that's okay, because all of us have had to grow up at some point. Amen? Are you on milk or solid food? Maybe you're here this morning, and the reason why you're on milk is because you're not a Christian yet. And maybe that's the first step that you need to take in order to grow up. You know, you can't grow up unless you're born first, (laughs) right? You got to start with being born. And if you haven't been born again in Christ Jesus this morning, we're here for you. Or maybe there's someone in this audience. There's someone in this audience who has been living as if they're a less mature Christian than they should be. And they've been thinking. And they've just been sitting in the pew and letting Christianity happen around them instead of happen in their lives. If you want help with that, if you want guidance with that, we're here for you this morning. And all you have to do is come while we stand and sing.